third and final technical um, demonstrator is um, Thomas Rawlings from uh, uh, Oroc Digital, who um, you have heard from in the qualitative uh, research. And he was kind enough to come and um, demonstrate some work that uh, his uh, studio is working on. So, Thomas. <coughs> Hi. Um, well, I'm going to do just a shoot through, really, of the project. I'll show some screen grabs where it is. But uh, and one of my colleagues, I've just noticed, who's been working on it, hello, Janet, is in the audience as well. So we'll both be around to answer questions after. Um, but the main reason we're not doing a technical demo is that having done our initial period of it, we've changed it quite a lot since then. And so I really want what we put out in public now to be representative of where we want it to be, rather than where it is now. Um, so. Yeah. So basically, as a games developer, I think it's important why we've come to this project, a bit of history of, of where we are. We, uh, as a studio, run a project called Game the News. And what Game the News does is we started a project turning news into games, which sounds like a slightly contradictory thing. Uh, and we were very well known for this game, which is Endgame Syria. This is a screenshot from it. Uh, and if you want to know a bit more about it, there's a lot on our site. But there's also on YouTube, uh, uh, I think, quite hilarious video of Russia today taking apart our game, strenuously objecting to the content in it on the grounds that we placed the Russians as broadly backing Assad, which they said they're not, they're neutral in it, and got very upset about it and proved how completely uh, ungrounded the game was. But there's an, it, it shows that actually gaming is moving out of the traditional grounds we expect it to be into these other areas. Uh, and, and news is just one of the many areas games is moving into. And obviously then arrives at the point why we're doing this. And this is obviously the, uh, this is a, a kind of close wind thing of a, I think it's an 1885 census map of Whitechapel where people have helpfully marked the important sites in, in the Ripper case. And the Ripper case is something that's absolutely fascinated me since reading um, from Hell graphic novel by um, Eddie Campbell and Alan Moore, and I got really into it and got very interested in it. So when an opportunity came along to look at this more, uh, I, I was really keen to look at it. So again, these are some of the things that we've been drawing on. So this is, um, these are from the Illustrated Police News, and these are um, really nice drawings of the time. Now, again, historically at the time, although photographs were around, they were still fairly new. They certainly couldn't be used in large print runs of newspapers. So actually, they, they employed uh, people to go around and draw what was happening. And they obviously didn't do perfect life views of it. They created their own stylized view of it. So here's a very heroic looking police officer in the middle pointing out something that's been happening. Uh, and interestingly, the, the Illustrated Police News, that is one of the most cited visual sources on the Jack the Ripper case, because they are so striking, didn't actually employ any journalists. They only employed artists to draw the pictures. And they robbed the text from other newspapers at the time, because copyright law didn't really protect them. Um, this is another piece of interesting thing. Uh, I apologize in advance, my slides are being chopped slightly, but um, hopefully it'll work. This is a, a memo um, of the Gulston Street graffiti, which is one of the key mysteries within a mystery of the Jack the Ripper case. So you can read the text of it at the bottom, and it says, the Jews are not the men that will not be blamed for nothing. Um, and this, this itself has provoked entire torrents of speculation on it. But from our point of view, it's really important because the fact that somebody's preserved this document, the fact that it's then been digitized, the fact that it's then available, is absolutely crucial to what we're trying to do. Without all the various people in that chain, from when that police officer first wrote that note to today, us being able to display this up here, we wouldn't have a project, really. The, the requirement of the research and development would be enormous to the point where it would be easier to do a game about zombies. This is another, again, just to show how there's an enormous amount of public domain information on the Jack the Ripper case. One of the things that makes it so interesting, I think, for us to delve into. So this is the From Hell letters, which the title of the comic I referenced earlier comes from. These are the ones that, personally, I suspect, almost certainly were written by the killer himself. But again, these have been digitized, they've been preserved, they've been replicated. And so the text within the letters, the actual you know, images of the letters themselves, are freely available, and therefore we can incorporate those into what we do. Now, there's a whole other discussion, which unfortunately I don't have time to go into, about there are some copyright complexities with us using this material, which are slightly annoying. But um, broadly stated, there's a lot that we, we can gain from it. So this is a screen grab of, of the site we've got. Um, and you can see we, we're already immediately, when we first announced we were doing this, we're starting to use the public domain material and starting to remix it ourselves. But this kind of, uh, you can see it again um, here, this, this cross-hat shading look, which to my mind, at the, the period in 1888, anybody outside of London who was reading about this case, and it was a case of global attention, 
this is how they would have seen it. This is what they would have seen. So we started thinking, well, if this is how they look, and this is, the, if you like, the public domain perception of it at the time, can we turn this into something visual? So actually, we've built a game engine that renders in crosshatch. So we build 3D objects, and then as you move around the world, it draws it as if it's hand-drawn. Now, on the one hand, you could say, well, why don't we do a simulation of what it really looked like? We could go for far higher uh, photo fidelity quality. Well, it arrives at the point where we don't know. There are a few photos of bits of it, but for example, uh, one of the last murder sites, I think the earliest photo there is around the turn of the last century. There's certainly nothing within the 1880s period. Mitre Square, there are no photographs of there. There's a few sketches. So lots of the key sites, they don't have photos existing. They have very little information. So in a way, we're being honest with the audience in, in using this hand-rendered look because we just don't know how it looks. So this is the best guess we can use. Um, again, this, this, the thing's been chopped off there, but I can tell you that it's, it's an interesting comment on a company called Spiel Games, a uh, German-based developer, I think, and they were talking about this idea of, of looking at the consumption patterns of people uh, globally and how much time they spend on things. And this thing really jumped out at me, which is on average 40 minutes is spent in, within a game. And he made this comment that games are now this long form of content. Well, if games are the long form of content, then in, you could argue this starts to replace documentary. Does this start to replace the novel? Does this start to replace the other things that media-wise we think of as the long form? And to my mind, that makes it all the more important that we're using this medium as a way to take on more difficult subjects, not the traditional subjects, uh, such as the sort of subjects we normally subject to documentary. Um, and so engaging the audience becomes a really key what this is about. When you're doing a game that is about difficult subjects, and the fact is there was a series of women that were horribly murdered. These are awful, awful murders. And we have to make it that it engages the audience because there's a lot to be learned from that. Both things that we've moved on from the time, for example, forensic techniques, and things that we haven't. For example, serial killers still pick on prostitutes because they are the other, they are turned, uh, their back's been turned on from society, they are vulnerable. So there's things we can still learn from it. So these are the difficult things we need to take on. The interactive thing is also really, really crucial. Increasingly, people are consuming media on devices that they can do anything with. And I've spoken to a number of newspaper people and things like that, and they, they still think of, well, they might look at, you know, they might look at our newspaper or they might go to the Guardian site or the Telegraph site. No, they're probably going to go to Candy Crush. They're probably going to go to Clash of Clans. So actually, if, you're, if your medium is static, you're losing an enormous amount. And we have to make it relevant as well. You know, if, if the ways that people consume this media is not relevant, then where are we going? And to my mind, I, I remember hearing ages ago, and I can't remember who said it, a quote by a journalist who said, the job of a journalist is to make what's important interesting. You know, what's relevant, interesting. And that's really something we're trying to do with this project. So here's another screen of one of the other areas we're using. So this shows some of the UI design we're experimenting with at the moment. This is the corner of Mitre Square. Uh, and this is the murder scene of Catherine Eddowes. So we can see the body there. And then as you click on various things, it brings up other boxes that show other connections that you can then explore and investigate. Now, one of the things that I think we can bring to the table that previous Ripper investigations are less able to do is because we're doing this within a game engine, we're going to be able to recreate not exactly how they looked, but we will be able to create pretty good physical representations of how that is. And then that's the space you can move within. And reading some of the material about this, there's a big discussion of, for example, was the Ripper a local? Did he have local knowledge? Well, actually, by being able to set up the routes where the police were, being able to set up where the victim was, and being able to get you to try and get from A to B without being seen, how easy is that? We can run a 1,000 people through that and see how well they do. We can get some data on the difficulties and issues within that. This is another interesting site that allows us to... This is actually the, this is the grave of Mary Kelly, the last of the victims. And again, we don't know exactly how that looked. But for us, it allows us to recreate these scenarios to actually turn back to the, the women themselves and you know, make them more than simply the the canvas on which some madman drew things, that actually they were people. We can explore their lives as well, and that's one of the key things we want to do with this. Um, if you're interested in the project and what we're trying to do with it, there, there's an email thing you can sign up to there. Uh, and I've also tweeted links to some of the stuff I've talked about um, from my Twitter feed, which will probably be chopped off for the next one. But it gives you a, a rough gist of, of what we're trying to do and how we're trying to evolve the project. And actually, the, like, as I say, the public domain aspect of what we're trying to do here is absolutely central to the next stage in the project. And I think, yeah, that's it.
Thank you.